Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Chai. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Hope. Good to good to be good to see you here as well. Uh, welcome to all of you. Hope you're having. Hope you had a good week, and uh, are being blessed day by day. Uh, welcome to all the e-learning students as well for the way that you've been engaging with the classes, the way that you've been connecting with us over uh, over discussions. Uh, it's it's wonderful and very encouraging to see that uh, each of you all are learning just as much as our students are here at the uh, at the online course. So I hope all of you all are doing well and uh, did some form of reading and uh, a recap of what we did last week. I know this is probably a question a lot of people don't want to answer. Um, but uh, um, any anybody, anyone would like to pitch in to give a, give us a quick um, uh, jot down of what happened last week? Anybody? Uh, first, uh, we spoke about A, B, C, D, E, like active events and uh, consequences and then mm -hmm. effective approaches and these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, yeah. uh, for that, we need to have rene a renewed mind, according to Paul. Mm -hmm. We spoke about that. Also. Right. Yeah. yeah. We took an example of that. Yes. Uh, so we spoke about, yes, Kennedy said we spoke about EUA. That's what we're going to be doing today, the stages in counseling. But before we, we did that, we looked into the frame of reference how it is important to enter into the internal frame of reference of another individual <clears throat> because or, or the counselee, because that's what really helps in uh, empathising with whatever their situation is. Um, so we looked at what external frames of references are, internal frames of references, and we also looked at a model. And we saw the ABCDE model, um, one, something that is very that can be practically used by uh, all of us. We took a couple of examples. Um, would anyone like to uh, share an example that they, uh, maybe something through the week that uh, they changed or they worked with, um, ha maybe taking from the ABCDE model itself, anyone who would like to uh, talk about something that the way that model, you use that model, you actually applied that model in the way uh, you are, you've you thought of or, or some area that you are struggling with. Anybody would want to bring up an example? So we looked at that A, the A is usually the, the event that takes place, right? Whatever is the situation or the activating event. And that tends to have a, a belief system that brings about uh, the, way, the way that the situation is perceived and understood brings about a certain belief or a certain thought system. And that thought, the more that the person thinks about the thought, there is a consequent feeling that comes about, right? And, um, and usually if they are negative, feelings, there tends to be a, uh, uh, there is a certain effect that happens. Uh, but that's where we learned about the D, which is disputing that belief by renewing your mind, changing the way you see a situation, you perceive a situation, you change your mind, change, renew your mind by changing those thoughts and disputing that original belief, and thereby having certain stronger positive effects in the way that you've interpreted that situation, which results in a behavior. OK, uh, I think, uh, uh, Chaya, you said you're, you're using this and seeing changes in your son's behavior with you. OK, the way I, I suppose what you, what you mean is that uh, uh, the way that you are perceiving your son is, uh, ch is changing. You're, 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 you're renewing the way that you see your son, and as a result, you've also seen that his behavior towards you has changed. Okay, Kennedy said, avoiding irrelevant responses. Okay, 
Okay, would you like to, um, anyone would like to elaborate on anything? Any other area? Anybody? Because I think the more that you use this in your own um, life, you'll be able to, you know, uh, live this out or help others understand uh, this, the, the model. Okay. Uh, so maybe I'll give you a very simple example just to, um, you know, add to this. And, and I think maybe I, I'd, I'd give you an example of a young, um, young person or a young teen. Uh, you know, right now in India, it's, it's the exam season. And um, so working with some teens, I do see that there is a lot of anxiety around exams and marks and future and getting the right course and uh, going to be in the right place. So, uh, so let's, let's look at that example so that, you know, it just helps to consolidate the learning once again. So the A is the the um, the exams, the upcoming exams, and uh, the B is the way that a young person would probably perceive it. So uh, it's it's perceived as something that's fearful, something that's uh, um, intimidating. Uh, you know, even even beliefs across that exam. You know, I may not do very well. Uh, I won't pass, or I won't. Um, I won't be able to remember what I'm what I have studied and that definitely causes a consequent feeling which is anxiety which could be which could lead to a the effect could be a avoidance or maybe going into an exam hall being extremely tensed and stressed and not able to not being able to relax and um, engage with the paper so that's that's the situation. Now, if you're going to use this model, what we would do is you dispute, help the child to dispute that belief, okay? And question that belief and ask, where did those thoughts of fear and um, uh, anxiety come from about the exam? And help them to, to um, work in, first of all, understanding what those beliefs, how wrong those beliefs are, and renewing those beliefs. So. As, as, a, as, a, as a child who, who's well-versed with scripture, helping them to look at scripture to encourage their hearts, you know, or the word of God to encourage them, said that they have the mind of Christ. The, wis the uh, wisdom comes from God, and God is Jesus is wisdom. And uh, as a child of God, whatever you ask for, you know, James says, ask for wisdom and it will be given to you. So helping them renew their minds with with the uh, with uh, with the right with the truth and with the right kind of thinking brings about a consequent feeling of hope and um, you know a, a sense of um, uh, a sense of excitement to do something to see the outcome of it and then you see a consequent behavior of uh, you know the person or the child being more um, stronger or more confident uh, in God and confident in, in what, what God has vested in him rather than his own strength and goes there to write a paper, okay? So just an example for us to, to uh, consolidate our learning. And I think, you know, in our everyday life to be able to use this because a lot of things is in our minds, you know, the battle is in the mind. And if we are able to recognize those wrong patterns or those wrong beliefs and uh, come to a place of disputing it or and renewing our minds with the truth, it definitely brings about uh, a, a better outcome in the way that we respond. Okay, so that's that's where we are. Let's move to our uh, next um, uh, chapter. And if we, if you remember when we spoke when we started class last time, we had said that um, that uh, there is a, there is a certain structure that is there even in counseling. Okay, and uh, we're going to be learning about that kind of a structure. And as a whole, when you're leading a counselee from point A to point B, 
what is it that we're doing? So where is it that we see that it flows from one end to another? And that's what we are going to be looking at today and the, the week after. And that's called, um, and that's what we, we call as the stages of counseling. Okay, I'm uh, just for you to follow through. I'm on page 21 in the uh, in the in the notes, so you could uh, follow through with that. Uh, additionally, I shall just um, put the screen, um, um, just just bring up the display of the PPT as well, so we can get there. Okay, all right, so. Uh, yeah, so before we get into the stages of counseling, uh, something that we've been reviewing and we've been uh, studying in the past few weeks is about um, this the task of helping a counselee to build a level of trust with us, with the counsellor. Um, and one of the ways in doing that is through building of a rapport. Right, and we spoke about that in length. How it is important to build rapport, the attitudes that a that a counselor holds of being uh, uh, empathetic, of being uh, uh, having unconditional positive regard, and being genuine. So, all of this um, brings about an attitude of understanding and acceptance, and um, th this becomes, like we said, the trust it becomes very foundational in that relationship. And without really establishing a place of, of trust, not much can happen in a counseling session. So the counseling needs to know that this is a person that I can trust. I have a sense of freedom to express and I have a place of being uh, accepted and not being judged for what I have done. So, so that's what you're, deter, you're building up in the beginning as well as through these sessions. So remember, whatever we are discussing, it does not stay in compartments. They're not watertight compartments. You keep building trust. You keep building rapport. Okay. So the counselor, what they do is you establish this uh, uh, the state of, of trust and rapport building by your acceptance, by your attitude. And the and another way that it is manifested is through the interest that you show, not just in, in, the, um, in the problem that the person is telling you, but also in the in who they are, right? The interest is not only you're not separating the person from the problem when you are building a rapport right so you you do you do show your interest to the problem but just as much you show your interest to the person and how do you do that is by being empathetic is by reflecting is by uh, showing that you are in a place of understanding where they are and what they are feeling okay and we've been working through that a lot and you will see that it comes as a very very significant uh, skill even as we are going to be progressing so how how does this happen that uh, how does this trust and rapport uh, work through a counseling session of course through the words that you speak and through the behavior that you show through your nonverbal messages and this is this gets built slowly um, but but yet it it continues to get built over time. So it is showing your consistency in the way that you express your understanding and your ac acceptance um, through the through the through the sessions. Okay, and that's that becomes very key. Um, so when when we're looking at establishing rapport and trust, just a few things to keep in mind. Uh, a few we I know we have spoke. About about earlier is uh, the first one is confidentiality okay so what we what we do what we had spoken about when we when we did the principles in counseling it's a general rule that we that wh whatever is shared in the counseling time or during the session is kept in confidence and this is definitely not um, 
shared with anyone else without the permission of the uh, counselee, except, of course, we, we spoke about that in cases of uh, any risk or danger to the life of the counselee or to somebody else. So this is um, uh, important in establishing rapport and trust. Okay. The second thing is to be able to establish a place. So um, ideally, you know, we suggest that it's done in a in a place that where where there is where there is privacy and not the place where the counselee may be tensed. Like for example, when it is the home of the counselee, uh, what what can happen is there could be other members of the family that creates a sense of discomfort where there may not be complete sharing. Okay, a place also where the counselee does feel safe, right? So it can it it can be. Uh, it can be in places where uh, where there is where there is also a sense of transparency. Like for example, um, you know, in a setting like like a like a, a ministry setting, there is definitely some sense some uh, open some sense of transparency, but also being all ensuring that there is privacy. Okay, um, where where the counselee does feel safe within the confines of the space okay um, the next one is same sex counseling now when when you work in a local church setting um, this is a good model to follow that is men counseling men and women counseling women however this may not completely apply to a uh, to to maybe a professional setup or maybe something that is a um, that 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 is like like for example in in chrysalis counseling we do see there are women counselors who meet men men okay and uh, it is understood that it is it, it's not a casual setting it is a setting that is um that is professional also just as much as we do follow the principles of scripture okay so same sex counseling is uh, recommended especially when it is within a local church situation when when there is a lot more of lay counselors that are involved uh, it it is it is a better more model to follow uh, the other thing that that we've put up here is you know being able to recognize certain limitations that as a counselor you may have is to know that there may be some issues or some cases that that you may not really be able to handle and may not have the expertise or the answer to and it may become necessary to refer them to someone with a greater form of experience um, uh, once you have been able to take them to to a certain point and being truthful and honest actually shows your humility in say in being able to address that there may be certain limitations that that may come in your um expertise of of working with people and it may be better that they they are seen by someone who has a better grip over uh, uh, different areas the last one is communication now communication is very important not just in counseling but even in a uh, in an interpersonal relationship right uh, and this is important um i think I'll, just go up to the next slide. Yeah. So this becomes communication becomes important because uh, as you communicate, it helps both parties or those who are involved to grow. Um, you know, so in in their relationship, to grow um, within themselves, to have a stronger uh, space of of uh, development. Because when when you communicate, what you're doing is just not communicating information, but there is a lot more that's being communicated. There is a communication of ideas, there's thoughts, there are emotions, there are questions, there are doubts, there are uh, there are solutions that come by. So it, that's something that requires an establishing. Communication definitely requires an establishing. So communication doesn't only mean, um, you know, to listen, or it doesn't only mean to talk, uh, but then it is a good mix of listening, uh, responding, giving feedback, uh, and and this 
and it becomes even more enhanced when there are conflicts in it. So, uh, so for a counselor to be able to connect and build rapport, uh, that is one thing that a counselor should be able to build on to to uh, to learn how to communicate, and also to learn how to identify maybe things that are really not spoken, but things that one can observe and to be able to make an inference and bring about, articulate an understanding is also what communication is about. Or even how, how does one resolve a conflict within themselves? You know, in, in, that happens usually in communication. So that, these are some of the things that is important for, uh, for a counselor that to build these communication skills, not only for a counselee, but even for other interpersonal skills. And, and the more that we develop our skills on that, it helps a lot better to communicate with others. So, so this is like, uh, you know, the, uh, the what is required uh, for establishing rapport and trust before we move on to the to the actual stages of uh, counseling. So, as we had mentioned, um, yeah. So as we had mentioned that um, we, you know, we 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 spoke about that counseling is a process. It is something that can go on for some point of time, and this process requires a structure it requires a certain framework and why is this necessary the structure is necessary because one for both the counselor and the counselee to know what comes it's like having a blueprint it's like having a reference point on what happens from one to another okay and that's that's why these uh, stages are there so that there is an understanding for the counselor on how to move forward and for the counselee to also see uh, see progress in the way that they uh, they are being helped okay so broadly when we look at counseling we divide it and now now even as i'm saying this you know if you look at other textbooks there may be other different kinds of stages we've just picked up i've just picked up the most simplest one for us to have a good form of clarity on what is the flow that yen, that generally takes place in counseling okay um and uh, yeah so this is a very simple form and this i guess is enough for us to basically understand what follows one after the other so in in at all there are three stages the first stage as we had spoken about last time is the stage of exploration the second stage is the stage of understanding and the third stage is the stage of action where the counselee is initiated and or moved into action. So when we look at the exploration stage, and I had brought this example to you earlier, if you were to get a new gadget or if you were to get something, uh, a, a new uh, uh, device, what you would need to do is go through these stages. You know, you need to explore it, you understand it, and then you move into action. So similarly, when a counselor and a counselee meet one with another, both together are going through this, these stages of exploration, understanding, action. Now, remember that uh, the counselee may not be in a place of understanding, and that's why they have also come to you is because they know there is a problem, but they cannot figure out what's been the source, what's been the issue. And often when, when counselees come with a problem, it's usually um, externally focused. The, the source is usually externally focused, right? They, they look at somebody else being the problem or something else being the problem rather than having explored whether there is any form of a contribution on their end of, of how this problem continues to be sustained. Okay, So what you're doing uh, is, along with the counsellee, is the first one, is uh, the exploration is the first phase of it. 
and what you do is encouraging the counselee to explore whatever they're going through, the difficulties that they're going through, okay, so that they are able to uh, come to the next stage. So you explore enough, you help them to review the situation. Remember, when we are reviewing the situation or the problem, we don't just explore only the event. We are going further into what this means, this event means for the person, how they feel about the event, what are they thinking about the event, what have they done about the event, and where they are. So exploration doesn't only mean finding out what is wrong. Okay, like for example, if a couple comes to you, you're not just exploring doesn't just mean that you're finding out when are they married, for how long have they been having a trouble, uh, what has been the source of their issue, um, uh, you know, and uh, how, how, are, how are the two of them dealing with it. That's not just the only thing. There is a lot more underneath it. What are they feeling about the present circumstance that they are in? How are they feeling about each other? What do they think about this marriage? What do they? Uh, what kind of? Um, uh, um, what kind of uh, strategies have they already tried that hasn't helped? What has those strategies meant to one another? So there is when we are looking at exploration, there is so much that you need to keep doing. Now, even as I'm, we placed it as one, two, three. Remember, this it doesn't mean okay, once we finished exploration, we tick it and say, okay, now we get into understanding. Maybe as you're exploring one part of it, for example, you're exploring um, uh, the home life of a certain person, okay, he's maybe this person's come to you with a problem with with uh, in at his home you're exploring the home life you've kind of got an understanding of it and you're moving into action and that's when another problem has tend to crop up maybe something has happened at his work and you may need to do that exploration of the of the work life as you may be going and working through the understanding of the home life right so these aren't watertight compartments you could be going up and down this ladder a uh, multiple number of times till you know you come to a place of knowing that holistically the person has been helped okay so stage 1 is the review of the situation and what and the other peripheral and uh, not the peripheral, the more deeper things of it, not just the peripheral things, which which uh, which brings about the feelings, which brings about the thoughts, the beliefs, the values, the strategies, and that's what that's where you come to. So that's stage one. Stage two is understanding. Now, what is understanding? This is a place where you are helping the counselee to identify what is it that they need, what is it that they want, so that they can work out their problems effectively. Okay, so it is moving from one place to another. This place is not, uh, is been dysfunctional. So you're, they want to move from a dysfunctional place into a functional place. So that is developing a probably a new or a prefer preferred scenario which means understanding. They say, okay, this is what I have been doing wrong or this is what I have been thinking. Now I want to move away from that into, into something better. Okay, so it becomes like a, like, like a informed decision that that first strategy doesn't work. It's not helping. I need to look at maybe strategy two to figure out how I can work through my situation. And the third place, third uh, stage is the, is the action phase. And this is where the counselee uh, brings about methods or ways or strategies to deal with their problems. So this uh, may be certain practical uh, 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 strategy, practical activities that the person does to give about the outcome that they were looking for in stage two.
okay so they so the the act action phase is the more doing phase the phase where there is a lot of activity happening there is there is motion hap happening stage one and stage stage one is exploring you're finding out stage two is coming to a place of um a decision that these are certain places that you want to work on and stage three is moving towards towards that that phase okay um do, is there any question before i move on from from this um any questions yes samuel <clears throat> thank you pastor first i was wondering um if there is where does commitment uh come like is it is it uh, a given uh, that the counselor and the counselee are committed to the structure uh, right from stage 1 or even before stage 1 or uh, somewhere in the stages there is there is um, a place uh, where uh, once we've understood the scenario uh, or once we've uh decided what action needs to be taken then we commit to that okay so when you use the term commitment i think i'd i'd probably use a different term it's willingness maybe in the fact that someone's come to you with a problem and uh so assessing their willingness to uh uh, assessing their willingness to work through a, a situation okay so you would assess that to to find out how much they they hear on their own accord that's one i think that's the very first thing are they there on their own accord or are they being pushed by a, by maybe a family member or somebody else okay so to understand that because that determines whether they want a, an outcome a, a committed outcome okay so that's the first thing uh, i i will take questions uh, once i'm once i finish right so that that becomes one the second thing is to uh, help establish from the counselee themselves as to what they feel should be uh, uh, should be a change in scenario that they're looking at or the goals that they want to work at or the way that i sometimes put it is what are your best hopes for our session forward or what are you hoping will become an outcome for you by the end of our session so what i'm what we're doing here is getting them involved in the thinking process of where is it that i want to go from where i am okay and why that becomes necessary is is if if that is not established during the exploring phase what happens is it becomes the duty of the counselor to bring about change in the counseling and that that is not what counseling is about okay because the counselee is the one who takes ownership of the problem and knee and uh, along with the counsel counselor helps to see an outcome that that could work better all right so willingness is one and secondly is building certain goals what is it that this person is looking at okay so there may be sometimes people are just there uh, and i've had many people just come and say you know i just want to share what i'm going through i i uh, i'm not really looking for a solution as to what to do and that's what we think that people come to come for counseling only to find a solution no they just come because they don't have people to talk to so they just want a place to just unburden to share to talk and be able to explore and while they are doing that they are also exploring okay so these are the two things that you will look for in the phase, in the first uh, in in exploration one is their willingness secondly is what do they see as their needed goals to work through now in your um uh, in your conversation with them there could be other goals that that you can bring up you can make suggestions you know like for example the person may say you know i don't want to do anything about it i just want to talk about it but then the counselor can come up with the suggestion saying you know uh, it appears that this part of your life has 
seems dysfunctional and uh, you feel that this is the contributing factor, is that something that you really want to look in and work with? So you are suggesting a goal and saying, you know, this is a place maybe that requires your uh, attention and your thought. So thereby, what you're doing is helping them to explore and come to a place of willingness or commitment towards the uh, towards working that forward. Um, Samuel, I hope I answered your question. Um, yes, Pastor. Uh, just just a little small follow up. So, um, but if if say you know, like you mentioned, um, the goal, like um, as probably as a, as a counselor. Uh, with experience, uh, you know, or or even with yeah, with experience with 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 the training, um, what makes sense is you know, if there's a problem, um, there should be a working towards resolving that problem. Yeah. You know, and 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 that's that's uh, that's ultimately that's what we're trying to do. Uh, you know, as a counselor with the counselee, uh, you know, help the counselee resolve that problem. But right. uh, as you mentioned, if the council is saying like, mm, I, you know, it's, it's, it's just a problem that I have and probably I'm not looking for a re resolution. I just want to share. Hmm. Um, I, I'm seeing that, you know, that I, I so how, how does a counselor like hold back? Like, you know, that's that this is the way the council should go and, and you're suggesting, you're recommending, but at the same time, you don't want to force it thereby you becoming the the person accountable to solve that problem rather than the counselee being that but at the same time you know like so so if a counselee just wants to share so you just share and then uh, you suggest a goal the council doesn't want that goal um, how do you end that uh, like what would be the next step in case the goal is not defined let's say the willingness is there to come meet you and share but uh, the outcome the desired outcome maybe the the counselee doesn't want that outcome for some reason. Mm. Uh, right. Yeah. So, so yeah. what over here we're looking at, there is no readiness for change. They are still what we call as a pre-contemplative stage of wanting to change. Okay. And right. uh, yeah. so what you're doing is uh, what you would do or you would take a step forward and um, process that very uh, situation once again with them, you know, like saying, um, okay, this is that dysfunctional place. Let's look at how this is affecting you right now, how this, uh, you know, uh, how, how this is being maintained and how this could, how this is helping you. So you do that exercise with the client, uh, with the, with the counselee where you're, where you're teasing out, the reality of this or your recommendation, you're actually teasing it out for them so that they have an informed picture that they know, okay, this is something that uh, that I need to do, but then I'm making a choice not to do it. Like, for example, you know, a cancer patient goes and says, I know I have cancer. And the doctor says, you know, this is what will happen if you don't do your your treatment. And, you know, it gives you all the thing, all the um pros and cons of it and it is given to the patient to make that decision so similarly you would give it back to the client to the counselee to make that decision okay and uh permit that because it's it's remember it's free will it's choice that that they decide what they want to do however you do and how i would end that is you know uh, i respect your decision and if at any point of time you feel that this needs to be looked into later and needs to move from just an understanding to a point of action, I'm always available to help you into the next step. And that's how you would you would close uh, uh, a contact like that. Yep. It, yeah, it, it, it makes sense, Pastor. Thank you. So um, I think few few things that I'm taking away is they're, they're definitely could take a lot of time to move between stage one, stage two, and stage three. And sometimes, yes, uh, you know, and sometimes stage two itself could just be the resolution where, you know, we just get an understanding of the situation. We know what action, but the, the council lead decides like the person not ready to move into an action and just uh, would want some more time to move into the stage of action. Yeah.
yeah actually you know uh, there is there is a, a, another um, just to quickly bring about an understanding there is when you're looking at change there are stages of change also okay so i said i i was talking to you about the um, you know there is a pre contemplative stage that they're thinking okay is it is it something that i should do um they they still you know exploring uh, maybe they're not even aware that they have a problem okay or they don't even intend to take an action or they are uninformed about the consequences of that behavior okay so they're in that pre contemplative stage the second stage is the contemplative stage where they 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 are becoming aware all right and they are also looking at ways of uh you know hearing out other other options and and uh, what could be the issues behind so that's the contemplative stage the third stage is called the stage of preparation where they are coming to a place of preparing saying okay i've got to move from here the fourth stage is action and the fifth stage is maintenance where you are getting them to work on maintaining the the course of action that they have taken so that's that in itself is is you know another theory where there is that stages of change pre contemplative contemplate contemplative preparation action and maintenance okay so you may have people coming to you in any of these stages right not that all of them come to you at a action stage and saying okay we are willing to go no you you may have people in very very different places and uh, uh and and working with them through that is um, is what counseling is all about okay all right shri uh, shri kumar and somebody else also i think had lifted their hands up uh mr you almost uh, you know cleared my doubts while you were discussing okay. with them thank you thanks a lot okay okay anybody else i think kennedy had put up a hand or somebody else i thought i saw one more all right okay all right so then then let's let's move ahead and uh, go on with with the stage so we we're going to be looking at stage 1 today and we're just going to be looking at exploration uh, the next two stages we will take over next week okay now exploration the stage of exploration um this has been i have broadly classified this under two headings okay one is assessment and the second is problem identification now even as i uh, you know as i've put it up in the slide like this I remember um this again doesn't flow like a flow chart okay when we are talking about exploration or an assessment an assessment has many um many purposes to it the first and foremost is you are getting to know the person as a whole not just the problem in itself okay you are identifying other areas of the person's life now even though there are there are 10 points on this okay it doesn't mean that for every counselee that you see you may need to go through each of this okay but this is just a basic um uh, basic areas you know those foundational areas that may be good to understand so even though i've said an assessment it's not like you're saying you know you're sitting there as an interview and asking about how many people are there in your family you know how much of income do you earn um you know what what kind of occupation do you have where did you study it doesn't it it's not it's not that straight ahead it is weaved into the entire conversation um as you keep going so some things that so i maybe i'll i'll give you certain examples of how i i i certainly i function and i do it it could be very different of, of how other people do it but when i first meet a counselee i to make them comfortable i talk about a few basic things and there itself i've caught up some of my information maybe i say you know where do you live so i kind of understand you know what part of the country or what part of the city that they live in who do you live with so then there itself i figure out whether they're married or whether they're single whether they have children uh i i kind of explore it what their age is uh where they're working so some of those basic things i start with and i also given like a 
like a small introduction about myself, about where I stay or what I do and what my background is, so that there is that sense of a beginning, you know, they're pleasantries, you'd call them pleasantries, so some kind of a welcome behavior that you would do in order to just calm the situation down. So you wouldn't start with, oh, okay, why have you come here? May I, uh, what is it that you want to talk to me about? Okay, because that that seems very, very abrupt and very curt. But to be able to weave some of these uh, areas into your conversation, okay? So uh, again, now, even though I've put in 10 uh, areas over here, you will also be judicious to look at how um, you know, depending on what the person has come with or, or the problem that they've come with, you will explore some of these areas. Now, for example, the person is coming and telling you about their uh, and has only this one issue is, you know, they, they have issues with their finances and they don't, they don't have a good relationship with money. They cannot manage their finances very well, right? They are... Uh, uh, they are too, um, I, you know, either too, too miserly or, you know, they, they, they're spendthrifts and they want help for that. So they've come to you with that. Now, even as you, you may look at things like their family background or their social emotional background or their, uh, uh, you know, but what about their occupation academic? Yes, those are things that you will look in. Maybe you won't look into their sexual activity there. Okay. Because you know, it it may stand out, uh, you know, like a uh, like a black sheep there, because unless, of course, in your conversation over there is some reference that is made, then maybe you will take a little bit of time in looking at that. So these ten areas, what I generally always usually focus on, again, weaved into the entire conversation, is definitely a family background, looking at you know, where they come from, what, what has been their family of origin, uh, how many members have been in the family, what's been the, uh, the, the general, um, the strength of the family, is it a joint family, is it a nuclear family? So these, these have, a, have a lot of bearing on, on the individual, okay? So family background is something I definitely do check. Social and emotional background is, is something that, again, I, I, you know, may not come in as a first off, but then again, like it, it gets weaved into the, to the entire conversation, maybe a social setting, like let's say they're talking about, uh, maybe let's say it's a married couple that's coming to you and they're talking about certain cultural uh, if uh, things that happen at their home. So I want to know what kind of a culture they are from. So maybe in that conversation, I'll say, may I understand, you know, which part of India you are from? or which part of the world, I mean, generally India, you know, and, and you kind of pick up, okay, there is this person who represents this culture, this represents this culture. And then I may ask them about, you know, what, uh, how have, how were things for y'all, uh, as, as y'all were children, you know, growing up, uh, what kind of um, difficulties did you face? Or what was your father working as? And there, I'm able to understand the uh, co context, the social context that they're coming from. Okay. An emotional background, again, is something that, that I do always uh, explore into because um, how, uh, for one, how have they been able to um, uh, handle difficult uh, difficult events or situations in the past. What has been their coping uh, earlier, right? So if they're coming here with with a with a significant struggle and they they are having an emotional breakdown, this is something I want to know. How have they coped with in the past? What have been events that have brought them uh, to a similar position like that? How did they get out of that? You know, how have they dealt with their emotions? That's something that again I will look at. Current family so social relationship, again, really depends on if they are talking about um, something to do with a, with a major relationship. That's something that I will look at. Also, if there are, uh, 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 again, this becomes important, you know, if there is an individual, a young person, uh, sorry, a, a single person coming to you and talking about a struggle, you want to know if there is a network of support system that they have. If they have uh, a, a good uh, um, you know, system that they can back on, 
you know, who, what have been their relationship with families or with friends or with colleagues or with the church. I, I need to understand that so that I can tap into it to help the person build those resources. Okay. Occupation and academic background, like I said, that is something that comes in uh, kind of naturally. Finances is something I may not really look into. Spiritual life is something I look into. But there again, it comes in, uh, it, it varies on uh, uh, on the conversation. So, so usually when it comes to that places, that place of understanding those crucial needs, those need to be loved, need to be um, uh, secure and need to be significant. At that point of time, I will probably explore, I, I generally explore that. I'll say, you know, um, what is, what is your understanding of spirituality? Now, now again, remember, when it when it's a believer or if it is a non-believer it is done a little differently right so we may not ask a non-believer without you really knowing what their background is you know what is your idea of god so the general question that i ask is what is your thoughts of spirituality where do you assess your spiritual health okay what kind of um, system do you system of belief do you hold on to so there you get an understanding as to where they are okay sexual activity is something i explore only if if there is a need like let's say if, if with regard to a marriage or with regard to someone who's having specific addic addictions um or you know that there, there are maybe certain mental health issues like depression or anxiety i will look at what kind of sexual activity they are in or if there are multiple issues within relationships they have multiple they have struggles with relationships that's an this that time it becomes an area that i will look into okay or recreation and leisure again something on on the way physical health that becomes important um, if let's say a person is coming to you and saying, you know, I have severe headache. I, the only symptom that I have is severe headache and I've gone to many doctors and all of them have said, there is nothing physically wrong with me. I have, I need to come, you know, they, they've asked me to go meet with a, with a counselor. Right. But you will explore that physical health. What have they, who have they gone to? What are the tests that they have done? What have been certain certain physical issues that they've had just to have an understanding whether if if you're not missing out anything remember in our lesson on human needs we spoke at looking at an individual as a whole right so so we, we're not just not just interested in that which is uh, which is at the core but we're also looking at physical issues and physical health like for example this person may not be sleeping at all okay and he's got a headache so um, you need to address that physical part of it. You know, young woman, young man, you need to sleep. You, you definitely require that eight hours of sleep. If not, you are definitely going to come up with a headache or a sense of fatigue, right? So that is important to generally have a check on if, depending on what kind of a manifestation or a symptom that they are coming with. And of course, a routine responsibilities, okay? So this... Uh, uh, be careful when when you are doing this that you know it shouldn't become like a tick and said okay I've, I've figured all this out okay now I will get into the problem like I said it has to be generally weaved in and it will come I think the more that you you know get into conversations it it will you will find that kind of a structure coming about okay all right oops I uh, went way ahead of time. All right, uh, shall we uh, close for uh, a 10 minute break and we shall come back and then I'll take questions and we can go from there. So on my clock, it's 10.53 and uh, let's be back by 11.03, uh, right? Thank you.